In the late 70s, programmers Michael Toy and Glenn Wickman met at UC Santa Cruz. And while they both wanted to be game developers and loved text-based adventure video games, they lamented that these kinds of games didn't really have any replay value since you could just memorize what to do and not actually have to play the game. Using ASCII characters, the two created a game with randomized map layouts, randomized object placement, and permadeath. This game was called Rogue, and it was the beginning of the roguelike genre. A little over 10 years later, Toe Jam & Earl was released on the Sega Genesis. Despite poor initial sales, it became one of the most popular games to rent, remaining in the top 10 until the Sega Saturn came out, at least according to the game's official website. This makes Toe Jam & Earl the most popular roguelike game of its era. Really weird to say. That's right, the most popular roguelike from the fourth generation of consoles was freaking Toe Jam & Earl. Hey everyone, and welcome to another brand new episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. And today, we're taking a look at a game on a system that hasn't seen enough love on this channel in a while. The Sega Genesis. Now, as you all know, I'm a Nintendo kid. Shock and amazement there. So I asked the people over on my Patreon what Genesis game I should tackle. If you want perks like this, you can sign up on the Patreon in the links down below to see what we're whipping up next. The majority of the votes on this poll went to Toe Jam and Earl. So, to these patrons, I want to give a big and hearty thank you. There are so many freaking difficult long games on the Genesis, and I was terrified we were going there. These are the same people who nominated Mario Golf Toadstool Tour, and probably a lot of the same folks who got me to play Persona 5 during Indie Land. But, they didn't. You do me wrong this time. They chose Toe Jam and Earl. So now we can sit back with a nice cup Hot G Fuel, code completions on checkout, 30% off, and enjoy the ride. Yes! All glory goes to the winner! So I'd like to start this whole thing off by introducing you all to the game the same way that I was introduced to this game as a kid with just the cover. Two weird looking cartoon characters that are probably aliens wearing high tops, a backwards hat, sunglasses, and a medallion on a gold chain. They are flanked by two musical notes while the skinny red one says jammin' and the fat yellow one eats a hot dog. I'm sure that the first thought in your head, like mine, was that this was a 2D platformer that is trying to be as nice 90s cool as humanly possible. Well, what if I told you you were actually wrong? Toe Jam and Earl is a roguelike. Yeah, I was surprised too. When you think of 90s mascots in the Sega Genesis, the last genre you ever think of is roguelike. In fact, this game was based off the game that started it all, Rogue. Rogue was a computer game that gained popularity in college computer labs in the early 80s. It was a simple looking, incredibly dense fantasy adventure game where the player's goal was to get to the bottom of a dungeon, retrieve the amulet of Yendor, and return to the surface. The catch was that the layout of the dungeon, as well as objects and enemies, were completely randomly generated. Toe Jam and Earl creator Greg Johnson was one of those college students who was a huge fan of Rogue and wanted to make a game just like that. He loved the foundation of Rogue and felt that you could just take the gameplay and apply just about anything on top of it. So while he was on vacation in Hawaii, he conceived the characters of Toe Jam and Earl. He thought it'd be fun to take these comedic sci-fi characters and put them in gameplay that was similar to Rogue or roguelike. Johnson met programmer Mark Voonsinger on a walk on Mount Temple Pius, related this idea to Vorsinger, and he loved it. Together, they created Johnson Vorsinger Productions, later Toe Jam and Earl Productions, and pitched Toe Jam and Earl to Sega of America. And the rest, they say, is history. You know, I didn't expect that the episode about Toe Jam and Earl would be the one that I go down the deep rabbit hole in the history of roguelikes. We've covered Dead Cells and Hades on this channel, and Toe Jam and Earl is the game that gets the deep dive? Pretty fascinating. I'm surprised because this game feels a lot slower than any roguelike I've ever played thus far, and because of how this game is presented. Because even though Toe Jam & Earl isn't a 2D platformer, it is still 90s as f**k. 
Toe Jam and Earl is the story of, uh, well, Toe Jam and Earl, which I gotta say is a poor name choice because either name could apply to either of these characters. If I showed a random group of 100 people these characters and told each of them to label which one is Toe Jam and which one is Earl, I'm pretty sure they'd be split 50-50. So just so we all know, the red one is Toe Jam and the yellow one is Earl. Okay, back to the story. Toe Jam and Earl were flying along in their Rap Master rocket ship from Planet Funk. You know what? Okay, this description is 90s enough to describe this whole game. Hey, Alex, can you help me out here? Sure thing, bro. Toe Jam and Earl were cruising around in their Rap Master rocket ship when Toe Jam decided to let Earl drive. Bad move, bro. They crash landed on the most unfunky planet of all, Earth. Now they gotta avoid Earthlings while gathering all 10 pieces of their ship so they can get back to Planet Funkotron. Bogus. Thanks, Alex. But even if that wasn't 90s enough for you, just check out the game manual online. In it, the entire plot of the game is explained through a rap that is written across two of the pages. Now, look, I absolutely miss stuff like this because it just adds that much more to the world of a game while being immensely entertaining. I would perform the rap for you right now, but unfortunately, I don't have to because you can find a recording of it on YouTube. It was originally released on a cassette tape you could mail order in from a magazine as a promotion for the game. It's it's six minutes long, and I love every second of it. Check it out when you get a chance. Even with this awesome promotion, however, the game sold really poorly at first. It did, however, become a cult hit due to rental stores like Blockbuster, making it the most popular roguelike of its day. This inspired publishers to support more games in the franchise, with the most recent game coming out in 2019. Now, I'm not saying this game is responsible for Hades, but no, you know what? Yeah, I am. Hades wouldn't exist without Toe Jam and Earl. Okay, obviously I'm joking here, but it's still a fun thought. Eh, I digress. Okay, so since we're in the era of 2022 and not 1991, I'm gonna be playing this game on Steam since it only cost me 99 cents, but it's also available for free if you have the Sega Genesis emulator on the Switch. The big difference for me is the Steam version has achievements, two achievements to be exact, chilling out maxing and relaxing all cool, in case you forgot this game came out in the 90s. But all this should give you the idea about how this completion journey is going to go. Toe Jam and Earl is weird, funny, and pretty f***ing chill, bro. When you get a game that has this much attitude, you expect it to almost be action-packed and high energy or octane, like let's say Sonic the Hedgehog. But this is far from the case, as this is possibly the most chill game I have ever completed here on the show. It's evident as soon as you start the game, a rocket ship goes by the title and a funky beat starts and those beats immediately set the mood. This is partially because the Genesis actually has two sound chips, one six channel FM chip and a four channel PSG chip. This not only allowed the system to have backwards compatibility with the master system, but allowed composers to layer different tracks on top of each other. For example, example, one could handle the melodies while the other is more on the rhythm section. Again, I don't know why Toe Jam and Earl is getting the history facts with the Genesis Sound deep dive today, but it creates a really cool effect. See what I mean? So the soundtrack for Toe Jam and Earl has a funky and leisurely tempo that mainly uses a MIDI bass. This has the same effect as listening to lo-fi music where I can just zone out and focus on the task at hand, which in this case is just casually strolling around. At a base level, Toe Jam and Earl is just about walking around on randomly generated levels. These are made of grass, roads that make you move faster, sand that slows you down, and water you can swim in. You look for one of the 10 pieces of your ship and find an elevator to get you to the next level. So this is incredibly simple, but it works. I think a large part of that has to do with the overall look of the game. Toe Jam and Earl feels like a 90s cartoon come to life, especially if you were looking to cram Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, and classic Looney Tunes together. Everything seems to move to the beat of the music, and even though the characters are very cartoony, it still gives a sense of calm. Once again, let's compare this to the mascot, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic looked crisp with bright colors and a lot going on all the time. Toe Jam and Earl is the opposite of that. The colors are darker and there is a lot less detail 
since all of the maps are randomly generated. But this actually makes my brain slow down a bit, like a tortoise on salvia. And it works because the game is all about taking your time and not going fast. And I wanna be clear here, I am not trying to bash Sonic. I love the blue blur. But he is the first thing people think of whenever they think of Sega. And Toe Jam and Earl serves as a fantastic niche by going in an opposite, more meandering direction. And if this game was just sauntering about, I'd be happy, but this isn't one of the earliest walking simulators. It's one of the earliest roguelikes. And for that, we need some more randomized elements. First off, we have the enemies. These are a bunch of different earthlings that are set on hurting our intergalactic duo. Most are pretty basic human stereotypes that'll seem foreign to creatures from another world, like the crazed shopper, insane dentist, fat man, and mower. But then there are the others that just seem weird to, well, really anyone. Like a giant hamster in a rolly ball, chickens with mortars, or the phantom ice cream truck? Why is it a phantom? Why are these chicken wearing Kaiser helmets? And why does the mortar shoot tomatoes? And these aren't even the most annoying enemies. The worst enemies are the ones that inhibit your progress and make it easier for other enemies to hit you. There are hula girls that force you to stop moving and dance, but you gotta do it at least once for that chillin' out Maxin trophy. Cupids that reverse your controls. Boogeymen that are almost completely invisible. Now, does all of this seem like a fever dream to you? Because it seemed like it for me when I first started playing it. Especially Especially since the enemies range from bugs all the way to mythical beings like Santa Claus. Don't worry though, more details on these characters are once again available in the awesome manual. You even get Santa's scientific Latin name, which of course is Ho Ho Hoium. And that randomness continues with the pickups. Health can be rejuvenated with food that you find on the ground, but that doesn't help you deal with these enemies. For that, you need presents that are left over by the aforementioned Santa. Presents are all around each level and contain a different item for Toe Jam or Earl. Only two of them can be used for attacking enemies, the tomato and the slingshot. The tomato lets you throw tomatoes while the slingshot lets you throw tomatoes farther. Now, these are useful, but they're not the best way to deal with enemies. No, the best way to deal with them is by avoiding them completely. Almost every other present is used to stop progression of the enemies, like a wall of rose bushes or the boom box, or increased mobility like the rocket skates or spring shoes. And of course, some are more effective than others. Although the rocket skates make you move the fastest, they can send you off the edge of a level which drops you to a previous level. Level. Some items are just awful, like the total bummer, which just flat out kills you. And then there's the book, which just makes you fall asleep. And you won't know which item is which because until you use them or have them identified, they are labeled as a bunch of question marks. In order to get them identified, you need to go to a wise man, a gentleman dressed as a carrot, who is one of the few good earthlings in this game. Sorry, I'm making myself laugh with, with these sentences. With this is crazy. Give him two bucks and he'll identify a present for you. You can find this money on the ground just like food. I'm sorry. It's just, what, what, what am I saying? Once again, this all feels like it was just the developers throwing random stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. And that's actually kind of true. Greg Johnson said that the main goal was to make something interesting happen to mix up the gameplay crazier the better but for some reason it's the simplest items that i found to be most useful my favorite items by far are the super high tops which give you a run button and the icarus wings once again you're welcome hades which lets you fly by tapping the action button these are incredible for exploring the levels and getting points so in order to get points though you need to explore the purple panels on the map and use the presents that you find and these points are necessary for increasing your rank. There are nine of these ranks and they range from lesser positions like Wiener and Poindexter all the way up to Rap Master and Funk Lord, the highest rank you can achieve. These ranks are important, not just for being hella cool, but for getting extra lives because you're going to need these lives to gather all 10 pieces of the Rap Master rocket ship and reach level 25. But even with all of these added barriers and randomness, I never got frustrated or anxious, which is kind of crazy when you think about, you know, hard NES, 
Super Nintendo or Genesis games, right? I was constantly in a state of chill because not only is the music great, but the game is really freaking easy. I maybe got game over once or twice just by misusing an item or getting cornered by a bunch of enemies. But that's fine because even if I lost all my lives, even if it was on one of the later levels, I could just start all the way over and it would only take me a couple of hours. Beating this game once takes about three hours and I did it at least twice because there is a fixed world mode that isn't randomized. So that's two playthroughs for a total of only six hours of playtime. But in both playthroughs, I was just having a blast walking around, swimming, flying, because Toe Jam and Earl, despite having a definitive identity, never shoves it in your face. While Sonic is all about speed and attitude and you're too slow, Toe Jam and Earl never feel that way. It puts you in the world and lets you enjoy it at your own lackadaisical pace. Greg Johnson believed that games should be accessible to all ages, both in tone and difficulty. That's why you never see an actual weapon in any of the game. He wanted a game that was fun for players for all skill levels. And I think he achieved that. This is something completely different from anything else in this era where a lot of these games are made difficult just so they could take quarters from you or in this case, your hard-earned dollars from Blockbuster Video, right? Where Sonic the Hedgehog feels like you could be on some type of drug, Toe Jam and Earl feels like a constant drip of serotonin. And this makes Toe Jam and Earl feel truly special. Yeah, Toe Jam and Earl feeling truly special in 2022. You're welcome. So surprise, surprise, there aren't any bonuses once you complete the game. Once you get Toe Jam and or Earl back to Funkotron, you get to walk around the planet and eventually reunite with your respective families. Game is over and you can restart to play it again. However, as it is so often in the case of these games from this era, there are secrets. In the very first level, you are surrounded by water. Using an inner tube or the wings of Icarus, you can travel to the top right of the map to get into an island with a bunch of presents. Or you can go to the bottom left and get to an island with a hole in the middle. And if you jump down that one, you'll land at level zero. Level zero has a kid at a lemonade stand that will give you an extra life. There's also a hot tub filled with ladies that refill your health. This is also how you get the relax and all cool achievement. Then if you jump off the edge, it takes you to the highest level that you've been to. Ah, but there's more. Once you beat the game and get to Planet Funkotron, go to the bottom right corner of the map. And there you'll find an island with an alien mermaid on it. Her name is Trixie and you can just kind of hang out together. And really, that's what Toe Jam and Earl is all about. My one regret with Toe Jam and Earl is that I did the whole game by myself. Greg Johnson described this game as a co-op title with a one player mode. And I can kind of see that. There are a ton of things I didn't get to experience like high-fiving to gain health or exploring the whole map even faster together. But even though I was alone, I didn't feel like my experience was inhibited in any way. I was relaxed. And even when things were taking a turn for the worst, I still felt like I could try again and get back to where I was with no issue. Toe Jam and Earl is a delightful experience that I am definitely going to do with some friends at some point in the future. That sounds like I'm agreeing to do drugs. Not, not what I meant, I'm talking about a video game. You know, I was blown away that the patrons chose Toe Jam and Earl. I expected them to choose something a little more rough, like Altered Beast, Golden Axe, or Echo the Dolphin. But they chose Toe Jam and Earl, and I can see why. It's a chill game that even compared to other roguelikes of today is completely unique. And I now get why this game has a cult following. Seriously, I really dug this game. It really makes me excited to try the next game in the series. And I wonder what that genre might be like. Oh, it's a 90s action platformer with, you know, attitude. Huh. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. Complete It!